There are a lot of lessons that one can learn from our great epics. We have two experts discussing this today. One is Indic scholar and author Dushyan Sridhar. He has learned scriptures like Sri Bhashyam, Gita Bhashyam, Rahasya Travasraram and Bhagavad Vishyam. He has delivered many live discourses in multiple countries and in several regional television channels. The next speaker is scientist and author Subhash Kak. A Padma Sri recipient, he is the region's professor of computer science department at the Oklahoma State University. They are going to talk to author and senior journalist Kaveri Bamzai. So uh, welcome both of you. It's such a pleasure to have you. Um, and uh, I really want to begin by asking you both a somewhat personal question. What started you off on this journey to uh, discovering ancient India, to discovering our ancient knowledge? Because uh, very little in our education system as such uh, prepares us for this kind of uh, understanding. So, uh, Professor Kak, to you first, what started you off on, on this journey? Uh, you being a computer scientist, especially. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me on this program. Uh, thank you, Kaveri. Uh, well, um, it's an old story. Uh, the mid 80s, I was working on AI, artificial intelligence. And that's when I remember that my father, when I was a little kid, used to tell me about Panini's grammar, right. which uh, represented uh, Sanskrit completely in 4,000 algebraic rules. Right. And now which uh, scholars believe is um, equivalent to the most powerful programming language right. uh, or most powerful uh, computing uh, device um, in its uh, capacity. So this uh, set me going. So I thought uh, this didn't quite gel with the accounts of Indian science that one reads in books. Mm -hmm. So I decided to investigate on my own. And I went back uh, through various layers of Sanskrit literature, going from the sutras to the Upanishads, the Aranyakas, the Brahmanas, and then the, the Vedic texts themselves. And I discovered an astronomy. I discovered a lot of stuff which had been lost for at least a couple of thousand years on which I wrote uh, many, many papers and books. And, uh, and then it sort of opened the whole horizon to me. And what I realized that the last 80 years has been, have been quite problematic in India. Mm. Uh, we uh, are teaching India through the Western gaze mm. to Indians. So, and, and it's sort of uh, ironical that the elite uh, still arrange for their children to learn about these things privately, mm. uh, but they don't want it to be a part of the curriculum. Mm. And uh, it's as if they say, what's uh, good for me is not good for thee. Mm. And so it's been a, it's been an interesting struggle uh, because there are those who deride this as if it's something regressive. It isn't um, in the West as well. People are enormously attracted to all these ideas because ultimately the very heart of the Indian tradition is the um, mystery of consciousness. In mm. fact, the Vedas are supposed to be Atma Vidya, which is the science of consciousness, mm. which is the frontier of contemporary science as it is. So in other words, it's great to be connected to the science and then the epics because the epics encapsulate this wisdom in terms of stories, in a fashion which um, young people and older people can relate to. Right. Professor Kak, before I go to uh, Dushyan Sridhar, I just want to ask you, you know, someone told me recently what's uh, happened with uh, Indian science and Indian research is that, uh, and, and Indian knowledge is that we've gone from practice, uh, from practice to the lab, whereas the West goes from the lab to practice. So is that, a, is that one of the reasons why you think that things like yogic consciousness, uh, you know, don't get enough uh, sort of credit in the West? Well, the, I think that's a much more complicated uh, story because um, Indian universities, the ecosystem that we need for critical examination of thought, uh, that doesn't exist to the degree it should. There are a lot of very outstanding people in India, in Indian universities, but by and large, there is um, 
and um, a desire to be validated by the West, which is good, you know, because we are all uh, the same global village and we are all colleagues. Uh, it doesn't matter Indians or non-Indians, but, uh, but uh, for, uh, for um, you know, the reasons of the Western gaze, I think that's what's frozen us into a, a situation. We, we don't want to look into certain issues. For example, you know, you'll be surprised a few years ago, there were courses at Columbia University and other leading American universities on management through the Bhagavad Gita. Right. Uh, now, I would uh, imagine that such a thing will never be done in an Indian university. Hmm. Yeah, that's a pity, isn't it? Uh, we, we wait for the West to validate us before we ourselves use our own wisdom, isn't it? It often happens. Absolutely, because it's still the Western gaze. You know, we have to uh, find our own spot mm. on earth, our own place on earth. And if even if we don't, uh, if, if we are very shy, we'll be thrust on world stage because economically India will be, India is already the third largest economy by purchasing power parity terms. And in absolute terms in the next 20, 30 years, uh, it's supposed to become number one in the next seven or eight years, it'll be number two. So people will expect us, people all around the world, they'll expect us to take leadership in these matters. Mm -hmm. They would want our universities to be much stronger. They would want our independent researchers to stride forth on the world stage, as many of them are already doing, like our other guests, and, and that'll be a wonderful thing. Right. Nishan, this is of course my cue to come to you. Uh, what drew you to, uh, uh, you know, to start on this journey? You also are, uh, you know, an engineer. You trained at Bits Pilani. You worked in the corporate sector for many years. So, what drew you to it, and what is the kind of feedback that you get, especially from young audiences? I was reading recently that uh, you uh, that your stories of Prahlad, the boy god, and you know. Uh, Hiranya Kashyap especially, they're very popular with young people. And yet, uh, as uh, Professor Kark said, they wouldn't be part of the curriculum. They would be taught privately, you know. Uh, so there's a dichotomy. Talk a little about your own experience. Uh, Kaveri, uh, we are a very, very, uh, um, uh, the family uh, valuing uh, civilization. Mm -hmm. So I have had the fortune of growing uh, up under the uh, tutelage and the love of my grandparents. Right. So uh, since my childhood, at least in the 1990s, I used to uh, sit them, uh, see them sit religiously listening to a lot of lectures in the night. So uh, it wasn't visual. So the very art of storytelling of all our scriptures, be it Ramayana and Mahabharata, draw, gave me the opportunity of drawing a beautiful canvas in front of me. Mm -hmm. Say, for instance, the Mahabharata, it has 14 times the number of characters in the seven volume Harry Potter. So, and the multitude of characters, the variety of emotions, if, if we weren't a civilization, as per historians at the point in time of Mahabharata, this book wouldn't, couldn't have arrived. So we would have been a very, very advanced civilization of those days. So the very art of storytelling of all our scriptures drew me very close. Second, my grandfather uh, was a retired employee from the State Bank of India. He was an astrologer too. So uh, while in school, we used to study about full moon and new moon and how the telescope helps see and living in Bangalore, we had this Jawaharlal Nehru planetarium and all of that. On the other hand, he used to buy a 10 rupee book at the start of every uh, Hindu calendar mm. uh, for five rupees uh, from Sri Rangam, which is a small temple town in the southern part of Tamil Nadu. And he used to come and he used to tell when Amavasa will come and when Paurnima will come. Yeah. So he was not depending on a telescope. He will tell when the next Amavasya is based on that five rupee book. <laughs> so if we have to come at a conclusion of when the full moon and the new moon is going to come, then see the amount of thought process which would have under, would have taken place in our civilization. So people were not bereft of the knowledge of the moon and the sun and the stars in those days. So these two aspects. 
And the third thing, uh, every vacation, uh, vacation generally comes in the month of April and May. And you know how, how terrible the summers can get. Yeah. But the coolest part of my summers was I was taken to a variety of temples in the south of India. And I was amazed looking at the architecture, even as a school child. And the very fact that a person without the advanced knowledge of engineering couldn't have even touched a pillar of those temples draw me very close to the civilization. So despite having a, a full-fledged Western education going to the college, I have had great respect for our ancient subjects as well. So it's never to uh, pull, pull down one uh, thought process over the other. I thought we could get the best of both worlds. And at one point in time, I just thought of calling my corporate career quits and came here. I don't have any disrespect towards the modern education. It, it, it follows a certain procedure. But I'm very, very proud of coming in a civilization that had the advanced techniques of medicine, engineering, uh, grammar, vocabulary, simple things, uh, Kaveri. But I, I'm amazed at our civilization. That amusement is still there every day, every minute. But uh, I'm still a primitive mortal before this huge university of uh, Sanatana Dharma. I believe you study uh, uh, between 10 and uh, 2, uh, 10 at night and 2 in the morning every day. Uh, you, you study and you sort of uh, learn uh, afresh every day. Is that true? Yeah, that, that's uh, even true. Uh, now that I have a three-year-old daughter, that's the only peaceful time that I get. <laughs> right. So, so you're <laughs> constantly learning, you're constantly seeking, you're constantly researching. What, what, what is it? Absolutely. That, yeah. yeah. Uh, what are the new things that you've learned of late which excite you? Uh, see, for instance, uh, Srimad Ramayana, or how generally it is called Ramayana, right. uh, has been the most important and the first of the works that we generally take and research and delineate upon. Yeah. So I've been doing that for the last 10 years. Now, every time I take Ramayana and compare it with the seven commentaries of uh, the uh, commentators, the very ancient ones, now I have understood that whatever I've known of Ramayana is very, very little. So every night, every minute when I read through Ramayana, it gives me that feeling that what have I been studying the same book for the last nine years? I have not come across this point. Why did I miss it? Right. So be it Ramayana or Sri Mahabharatam, every shloka has been delineated by the commentator so beautifully that you always have the feeling that you should go back to the book again. So see, generally that doesn't happen with books, Kaveri. Right. Let's take any Blighton or things. Right. Suppose we have a series, you take one book, you read, you wouldn't want to read that novel again. That, right. That's very... And here, every time we read Ramayana, the same set of 24,000 verses with that seven commentaries, it gives you a very, very different dimension. I can't tell you how beautiful it is. So that is one aspect. The second thing is, uh, at the same time, I have a huge uh, respect for the findings of historians based on evidences. Mm. So we must learn to respect that as well. So when I compare how uh, the, uh, let's take the iconography of Durvasa, mm. how it has been projected to the temples, you'll be amazed of even the sculptors who may have had to have degrees in those days to sculpt. Mm. Because if they have to be very specific about the iconography, it, it is the case. I'll just give you one small finding. It may be interesting. Uh, generally, when we portray Rama, Sita and Lakshmana going in the forest on the exile, we say that Rama was being very simple. He had to relinquish his kingdom, the wealth. So all his ornaments were seized. So he went like a hermit. Mm. Similarly, we showcase Sita also in the hermit dress. We showcase her of having relinquished all the wealth. Not so. She wanted to, but in Valmiki Ramayana, Dasharatha, the father-in-law tells, my daughter-in-law shouldn't suffer just because my son is suffering. Mm. She should have all the riches wherever she goes. Mm. That is why the commentators have said, the moment she left Ayodhya for all the 14 years, she wore silk, chinam shukaihi, and she was wearing all jewelries. So Lakshmana carried the clothes and the jewelry for Sita for all the 14 years. Okay. This is never projected in our visual canvas. Never, so, never. Yeah. yeah, so so this is this was proven by commentators. Right. So generally filmmakers may not take the time or have the time to research, right. but it's that was amazing for me. So Sita is wearing silk and jewelry throughout her uh, forest life. Right. So, uh, you know, such elements yeah. make you wonder how much of detailing has gone into our scriptures. Right. 
also i think the uh, the changing iconography of uh, lord ram as well uh, uh, over the years he's become more martial is there enough evidence uh, in in the text to show that he was he was dark mm -hmm. and it is very mentioned very clearly that he was a mix of the dark green dark blue and gray hue so he was not one color he was a mix right. of all the colors right one and second thing throughout his 14 years of exile he is said to have never shaved hmm. he never had a shaven face right. so he had a huge jata and he had a huge beard is <laughs> what shrimad ramayanam tells and so is the iconography so we can never see arun govind or nt ramarao in the south had the gillet uh, shaven <laughs> face but he had a long beard Right. and uh, so you know if we project that today people may think we are doing a mistake yeah that's the case today right. but uh, truly he had a huge beard huge huge beard that's so the body yes and he was of 8 feet uh, kaveri wow. as per sundara kandam sita asks hanuman tell me the height of uh, rama because you say you are a messenger of rama he says very clearly numbers 2 into 4 8 feet wow was his height yeah. Right. Professor Kark, all this is so fascinating, isn't it? But when you, uh, uh, you know, present uh, evidence like this to the world, when you talk about, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the science evident in our ancient uh, text, uh, do you see a degree of skepticism not only in the West, but also in India? Not at all. This is all peer-reviewed Western journals, right. as well as Indian journals. Right. The, what, the, the science that I'm talking about is not uh, uh, something which is uh, far out, you know, right. which is in the fringes. I'm talking about uh, researches uh, or journal articles published by a variety of people, both yeah. Westerners and Indians, right. in uh, peer-reviewed journals. So I'm talking of impeccable science. Yeah. And uh, in India as well, in fact, one of the most prestigious journals in this field is a journal published by Indian National Science Academy in Delhi called the Indian Journal of History of Science. And, um, and, and, and so anybody can go and look at uh, that information. Uh, my own work has appeared in the Royal Astronomical Society, in uh, American journals, whole, uh, whole uh, series. Um, and uh, I suppose, but I to come back to the really heart of your question, there are some people in India who, who are skeptical and they're skeptical because they haven't seen the evidence and they haven't seen it in the textbooks. Yes. So if you don't know the evidence, then it is natural if you are coming in uh, from a background where you have been told that there was no such science in India, because these are one of the two things that the British did, the image of India that uh, the Indian elite have uh, embraced is the image that, first of all, India didn't have any science, so we must depend on Westerners to guide us. And number two, that India also didn't have any true history. India was always a struggle between various castes and groups. Right. So what the British did was that we didn't have any agency, hmm. right? And, and, and that's of course not true at all. The whole idea of frozen castes is false hmm. uh, as a new scholarship. Again, uh, it's not just uh, Indian scholars. Uh, some of the most prominent Western scholars have been writing on how the idea of uh, the rigid caste as we see it now was created only about 1901 census mm -hmm. when uh, different jatis who didn't quite know which varna they belonged to because every jati thought it was the best, which is the way it should be. <laughs> and of course, uh, the, uh, the economic situation of a community can go up and down based on different times that we live in. But the English forced, uh, you know, they said this jati belongs to this varna, this jati belongs to this varna. Now my own take on all of this is that every human being has the same purush within. Uh, this is what the Upanishads, this is what the Veda says. And since in the Purusha Sukta, it said that out of 
the head of the Purusha came the Brahmin, out of the arms came the Rajanya and so on. Therefore, each human being, no matter what jati they come from, no matter what background they come from, has all the four varnas in them. And, and in different roles in our lives, at different moments in our lives, we are sometimes more uh, concerned about uh, general understanding or in taking charge, which is what the Kshatriya's role would be, or preservation or service. Uh, so, so all of us are that, but somehow, and uh, this is not just the Westerner who has uh, accepted or adopted or embraced these categories, but as I said, a lot of Indians have come to believe that this is how it has always been. And this is why um, a lot of the scholarship that comes out of Indian universities um, falls by the wayside because they are projecting their current understanding to the past. The past was not quite the way as it is now. And we see that in all the wonderful um, temples that we have, all the various Shastras, uh, you know, the Sthapatya Veda and so on, the great architecture unparalleled, you know, the beauty of Indian architecture. And coming back to the epics and the, the, the knowledge within, uh, let me just mention one small point. You know, the, the big uh, frontier of modern science is uh, where does consciousness come from? Yeah. Because if we're all machines, why is it a computer conscious while we human beings, our brain machine is conscious? Now, uh, and, and if everything is by natural law, how do we have freedom? Mm. Now, all this was debated uh, or discussed or described thousands of years ago in India. And in Vedanta, there is an idea called Drishti Srishti, mm. that by Drishti, the laws are not to be suspended. By Drishti, divinity creates. Mm. And, and this is something which uh, has been demonstrated. It's a part of modern science, quantum mechanics, and an Indian, a very great Indian uh, physicist who was a good friend of mine, George Sudarshan in the 1970s, created a theory which is called uh, the quantum Zeno effect, where it can be shown that just by observation, you can control a physical system. So just imagine very subtle thought in India, which will still be of significance to science. So it's not just for antiquarian interest, not just for literary interest. And that all is, that is enormous. You know, Mahabharata is the biggest text that there is, or Ramayana, or Yoga Vasishta, which incidentally uh, was created in Kashmir. So we can smile yeah. at that. <laughs> so these are amazing texts. Uh, but apart from literature, we have sciences, nice. which would be relevant in the coming decades. So it'll only be good that we should not just say it's religion. It yeah. is science. Shastras of our tradition are science mm -hmm. and they should be taught to everybody. Right. In fact, uh, just an additional point to this, uh, Professor Kark, you know, while the world is talking about uh, artificial intelligence and the challenges of artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, and we're talking about China having taken a 10 year leap ahead of us. And, you know, uh, we are, uh, I suppose, uh, justifiably worried. Uh, what is there in our consciousness and our study of consciousness that can actually enable us to leapfrog in a sense ahead of uh, uh, the world uh, as it were currently? Is it possible? Of course, uh, you know, Indians are the most successful community in the United States where yeah. there is level playing field. You know, they are the wealthiest, as you know, they are powerhouse uh, uh, in the, in the, on the West Coast in all high technology companies. So why? Because uh, not necessarily that they are smarter, you know, they're smart people in all cultures. We are, we are, we are as good as anybody. But our um, culture gives us certain strengths and that's where the epics come in. It gives us certain strengths. It gives us Atma Vishwas. It gives us self-confidence and it also provides us a certain kind of psychological and emotional security, which is what you need, an anchor in order to, uh, you know, stride out and do whatever needs to be done. Now, if India is a bit behind China, I won't say that China is 10 years ahead. Uh, the reason why Chinese have done very well 
in the last 10, 20 years and Indians haven't done that well is because India adopted the wrong model uh, for bringing in computers to India. They brought in computers by saying that, or IT, by saying that we will be the back office. Yeah. Uh, and that is the East India Company for the St. Paul's model. Yeah. You know, the English do everything and, and the back office in the dark rooms, there are the Indians who are um, updating the ledgers. While what the Chinese did uh, or the Japanese or the Koreans have done, they have focused on products. Once you have products, then you occupy a certain space which allows us to do further innovation. So I think what India needs, um, India doesn't need any, any difference in our mental attitude to the world, but it needs a change in our science and technology policy. Uh, and not everything can be done by the government. I think what we need is for um, the prime minister to bring together the leading uh, business people uh, in India and tell them, please do such and such stuff because the government cannot do these things. You know, products cannot be made by the government. They need collaboration uh, with the government and with, with uh, private public partnerships perhaps. No, or just the private sector. And, and of course, there's always uh, um, underlying all uh, such uh, enterprises a certain uh, collaboration. For example, one reason Google is so powerful uh, across the world is because Google gets a lot of subsidies or hidden support from Department of Defense in the US. Right. So if we had great products and there is some attempt to produce some of these products. If we had great products, clearly the government of India, Indian armed forces, defense, and many other sectors would also use it. And there would be a subsidy, right. indirect subsidy. Uh, you're, you're part of the prime minister's uh, council, if I'm not mistaken. Is such a thing happening? Well, I, I can't uh, talk about, I, uh, you know. Without specific, giving too much yeah. away, yes. Yeah, but, but I, I must uh, say from what I can see, clearly um, at, in the council, in the Prime Minister's Council, we do discuss all of these questions and uh, the council uh, looks at the very large initiatives that we need in the field of science and technology. And there's some wonderful things that are being done. Um, for example, um, genetics or uh, underwater exploration or this and that, but, uh, uh, but I think um, in addition to whatever the Prime Minister's Council or the government might do, I think um, a lot of the initiatives should come from the private sector. Yeah. And, and they, they might need assistance and they should certainly seek that. But uh, first of all, you have to dream. You know, you cannot create things without a vision. And I think the problem with India for the last 25 years was that the vision was wrong. The vision was too constricted. It was too, it was coming from a place of fear yeah. that we can only work for somebody else. Yeah. Let somebody else give us some work to do and yeah. we'll do it. And we need a bold vision. We can do things, we can provide um, um, AI or new machines or automation for the entire world. We shouldn't be doing it just for India. Yeah. We should be doing it for the entire world. And yeah. it is possible. Indians are some of the smartest people in the world. And, you know, we see it all, all across in every corner of the globe right now. And, and, and then we also have something more. We have this amazing wisdom, you know, yoga. You go to any corner of the world. People want to know who they are. And yeah. that's what yoga is all about. Even in countries like Saudi Arabia, Iran, people want to do it. Everybody wants to know the truth, but right. we have to go out and explain it to them. Right. Dushant, of course, you're doing it in spades. You're explaining to uh, people who they are. You're going back to ancient wisdom and uh, finding examples from there and explaining uh, you know, the way of life to uh, youngsters, especially. Do you find that the next generation could be perhaps better equipped to deal with these challenges of AI and you know these algorithms which know us better than we know ourselves? Yes, uh, we do, uh, Kaveri. In the last 10 years, uh, the audience which I have analyzed myself and through the analytics which uh, YouTube throws 
I see that there is a, a, a good rise in the uh, lesser than 45 years of age population which listens to lectures. Hmm. One, listening is one part. And uh, I receive quite a lot of mails every day from people, from students who are actually doing artificial intelligence and studying nanotechnology stating that could this in Ramayana have relations to uh, artificial intelligence? Could this in Mahabharata have a relationship? So more than checking if uh, there is a relationship, the point is there is a thought in the students that could this be related to. Right. So the very stage, the very thought process itself is very, very refreshing and very good. Uh, this is on one side, Kaveri, but when talking about students and children, I feel in the curriculum itself, without making it uh, uh, sound, because today, if something from the Ramayana or Sri Mahabharata or the Bhagavad Gita is brought into the school syllabus, we will be filled with newspaper pages because the reason is, uh, the, the world views the word religion yeah. from the Western point of view. Right. So, so uh, the, the very thought of religion in the West is very not inclusive. Whereas Sanatana Dharma largely uh, relies itself on the universality. Right. So that universality point of religion is never taken from the West. So the moment we say that there are certain aspects that we are going to bring from Ramayana and Mahabharata, there will be a lot of controversy in it. But trust me, Kaveri, if they are brought into the school syllabus without disturbing the current education system, right. it will give in a lot of ideas for the students. Just for example, the tree is called by a variety of names in Sanskritam. Yes. But there is an interesting word called as Padapa. Yes. It's called Padapa. Why? Padena Pibati Iti Padapa. The one that drinks through its roots is called as Padapa. Right. So the body, B-O-D-Y, the body is indicated by a variety of names. But look at the variety. If the body keeps reducing in size, it's called Shariram. Shiriyate Iti Shariram. That which reduces. That which keeps increasing is called deham. So in those days, you didn't need to bring sarcasm by or body shaming through the line. So if you say and you call a person, oh, that's deham. That means a person has put on weight. Okay. So, you, so the words themselves have been so very well designed to bring in emotions as well. Yeah. So right from that till the very aspect of Agnihotra, uh, the, the fire ritual, which a married householder performs with the aid of his wife has three Vedikas, three positions where the fire is kept. So one is semicircle, one is circle and the third Vedika, the Agni Kunda is in the form of a square. Right. So Aryabhatta very beautifully brings it from the concept of Mahabharata and states that how will I design a square, a circular Vedika as the same area as that of a square. Then he brings on to the very fact of Chatur Adhika Shatam Ashtagunam, 4 over 100 multiplied with 8. Chatur Adhika Shatam Ashtagunam, because in Sanskrit, Guna means multiplication as well. So when you multiply and add it to 62,000, Dva Sashti Sahasranam, 62,000, and divide it by Dva Ayutascha, divide it by 20,000. Whatever value you get, if you divide and uh, multiply and then divide, you'll get it as 3.1416, which is the pi value. Right. So he says, use this pi value 22 by 7 to get the area of the circle. See, look at the ritual called Agni Hotra. Hmm. And in the due course of very casually explaining, he brings out the concept of pi. Right. For us, in the university stage, we will have one patent, one research paper to speak about Pi, and he casually brings it in the conversation. You know, such points then induced very uh, interestingly and yeah. very engagingly in the school syllabus. I don't think we will have a lot of people mocking and questioning the ancient sciences that we have had in the future generations. Today, there is this mocking. Oh, did he do that? Did you say that he had he knew about Pi? So we all believe in the concept of written papers. Our system has been very oral. So uh, we have been a very oral civilization. So it's all what we learn by hearing. So when a lot of things have not been documented the way the West wants it, it doesn't mean that science didn't exist. It doesn't exist in the format in which you want. So probably today, as uh, uh, Indian citizens and as people who are very proud of the civilization, probably we should get into documenting okay. all of that. 
the way the west wants it not to impress upon the west to tell the west to correct the notion that they have about the country right but uh, also this means a complete retraining of the uh, the teachers as well it's not just the students but yeah. also those who teach yeah true true see my mother has been a teacher in a school for the last 30 years so imagine we have a multitude of teachers across the private the international schools the boarding schools and the government schools across cities and towns and uh, villages so that's going to be a huge process but given that we are using we are beneficiaries of the current technology kaveri mm-hmm. i don't think like 30 years before there was no youtube there was no training right. S- right. suppose the same pandemic had happened 30 years before yeah. i think there was there would be no online classes of course so yeah. one year would have gone today we have classes happening online so when we have made use of technology even during the times of pandemic now that we are in the recovery phase i think training teachers also through technology is not impossible so we are at that stage now we can take the aid of technology and train them it will be a painstaking process and that's not going to happen in a year that's going to happen in a few years but i think the the, the very foundation for that process has to be laid as early as possible right uh professor kak do you see evidence of it in the new education policy that we have in india currently which actually does talk about all of this which talks about experiential learning which talks about looking at our ancient knowledge do you see that happening uh, seriously i I'm, i'm not very knowledgeable about the details of uh, nep but uh, you're right you know th- th- there will be uh, more focus on l- uh, learning or teaching in uh, mother language for example right. mother tongue right. and I th- personally i think that's a very important factor and maybe that is one factor which has uh, make made us fall behind china yeah. india is the only major economy in the world where sciences are not taught in the mother tongue Mm-hmm. and in particular uh, for uh, computer programming uh, one has to learn english before one can learn computer programming in india while in china or korea vietnam or hungary or in israel people learn uh, programming um, through their mother tongue it's the same program you, they still write they use the same symbols but they don't have to learn the english language i think what has happened in india is that there's become a kind of a divide there is the divide the city versus the countryside mm-hmm. countryside meaning people who are using um, their language you know where people are much more proficient in um, in indian languages now fortunately there are some um, leaders uh, uh, business leaders in india who are saying that this is all nonsense um, and they are saying that um we don't you don't even have to have a formal college degree to do computer programming for example uh, because what is computer programming these are only procedures you do procedures everybody learns to uh, use a smartphone yeah uh, and now a pro- pro- the programming is a bit go- goes beyond that you have to have a certain uh, discipline so to come back to nep yes uh, uh, that will make uh, a great deal of uh, difference uh, now uh, one important um, uh, and perhaps not such a big or difficult initiative is to introduce one course in school on history of indian science yeah. and a course in college you know all impeccable based on impeccable work which scholars all around the world accept Right. and it's not it that uh, indian uh, sciences were all oral or uh, they were not for- formally written down in fact they were siddhantas they were texts they were formal books which can be dated uh, quite like uh, books uh, elsewhere in the world quite like let's say greek books or books in europe so we have and scholars know all of this stuff so you can put together a course and i believe such a course is being uh, designed or created uh, in india by scholars and that will be perfectly oh, that's acceptable to yeah. there should I not be any controversy on that i think it should be taught to everybody <laughs> uh, absolutely and that. and also uh, kaveri there's another reason why such a course should be taught yeah there are people in india who make claims uh, which are so far out that 
they are ridiculed for one thing and all of Indian culture gets ridiculed in the process. Right. You know, if you suddenly say that uh, 3000 years ago, we had flying planes or yeah. this or that. Now you can look at all of that as metaphors or imagination or possibilities that the Rishi or the Kavi thought up, but you, you, you're not to take that literal as literal truth. If you had a course, if you had a course where good information was present, you know, if you have nothing, then bad information can take yeah. the charge, can take control of that space. We need good information to drive out what is not accurate and correct. And that'll be good for everybody. It'll be good for all of us, not just for the prosperous Indians who can uh, hire uh, a tutor to teach their children all the good stuff, but for everybody in India. And then all this unfortunate divide that we have in India right now, that there are these skeptics who think that this is all made up, yeah. you know, and that'll go away. It's not made up. It's like, you know, Europe had a glorious civilization. So had we, let's just embrace it and then move on and then deal with the problems of the future. Because ultimately the problems that are important for everybody, for us as members of society, are problems of the future and present. So right. let's just not fight over the past. Let's embrace whatever is impeccable and accepted by scholars around the world and then move on. This is what I say. And I hope such a course is taught by you. Uh, just the last uh, uh, last points from uh, both of you. Two quick point. Uh, one quick point from both of you. One uh, one thing that you'd like to see happening, perhaps in the education system, perhaps in the ecosystem uh, uh, in India, which would really uh, make us appreciate uh, uh, our ancient knowledge and also not uh, appreciate it and understand it, and at least begin to understand it. Uh, Dushyant, uh, you, and then Professor yeah. Papa. So uh, one thing that uh, in the education system in the year and in the years to come should bring across uh, all the metros and cities without the, the country and the uh, city divide is to somehow uh, uh, engagingly bring Sanskritam yeah. as a language mm -hmm. in the curriculum. Uh, though there could not be not the a, way it is currently. Yeah, not the way it is currently. At least Sanskrit was still there in schools yeah. and colleges for the last fifty years, but it was as if it was a third language or a second language, yeah. and it was meant for scoring. And you could write the answers in English, and you can still score. Not yeah. that way. See, all our agamas, be it uh, Srimad Ramayanam, Sri Mahabharatam, or Arya Bhatiyam, all these books that we speak of, right from Siddhanta Kaumudi to all of this largely uh, Kaveri. So if if I have to appreciate the uh, the values and the uh, science and the other sciences that we had in our ancient civilization, and I again go back to an English translation. <laughs> so I'm still not serving the purpose because yeah. uh, because it's, it's, it's after all a language of 26 letters, English is. So yeah. the permutation and combinations of the words that you get is still going to be limited Limited, whereas this has 256 characters, Sanskritam. So look at the amount of words that we have. So it's very, very important that we imbibe the language as a part of our curriculum so that you don't need another person to explain the verse of Ramayana because it will be like reading the English newspaper. So the Ramayana and Mahabharata, they won't be misinterpreted. They won't be uh, uh, exaggerations. You know what will be the upama, like how Subhashji said, you will know what is the simile there, what is the metaphor. So all that knowledge will come to you when you know the language well. Mm -hmm. So imbibing Sanskrit as an engaging language during the school days across metros and villages without any distinction. Of course, it needs a lot of training on the part of the teachers as well. So if that's going to happen, uh, I feel uh, the life or uh, probably our process to uh, appreciating ancient knowledge will become all the more easier. Without Sanskritam, without that knowledge, it's going to be that tough. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, Professor Kak, closing words? Oh, well, I agree. Um, um, making it easier for uh, young people and uh, older people to learn Sanskrit. And that's where we can use technology. You know, there is something that has changed, which was much more difficult to do, uh, say 20 or 30 years ago, where uh, the school or college curriculum um, was literally the only place where you 
got uh, connected to the past or to science or technology, to the present and everything else. Now you have the social media, you have the internet, you have technology, which make it so much easier. And in fact, um, uh, some of the um, thinkers in the educational field in the West are saying that the brick and mortar university may be a thing of the past because it's much too expensive to teach uh, physically in a, in, a, in a physical location at a university. If, if we are gonna be using IT, information technology to communicate perhaps as, uh, as, as an addition to what people learn uh, from a guru or from a instructor at school, um, what uh, I would want uh, uh, leaders in India, uh, in the government or in the business world to think is how do we harness this technology so that we become global leaders in using this technology for right. sending out education. And, and then this knowledge is of interest, not just to Indians, it's of interest to everybody. How can we therefore create a future university kind of a setting through the uh, through IT, which would uh, make its uh, impact across the world. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Professor Kaag. Thank you so much, Kushi and CJD. It was a fascinating conversation. I hope we have one such again soon. Thank you. Thank you for Thank being you, with you in the next. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar. We hope you really enjoyed that session. You can find the entire schedule of ThinkEdu 2021 on our website, eventexpress.com. You can watch the rest of the sessions on our YouTube channel, eventexpress.com, newindianexpress.com and edxlive.com. You can also check out our Facebook and Twitter handles. Thank you for watching.